So this morning, we're going to be looking at the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jonah chapter 1. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read Jonah chapter 1. So like I said, I have the New International Version. I'll be reading Jonah chapter 1. And this is the, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell in a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call upon your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come. Let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder and wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done to us as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered him a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. So looking at God's word, um, Jonah chapter 1 is not about Jonah. It's not about a big fish, it's about our omniscient, all-knowing God. He's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere we can go. And nothing about the story of Jonah is going to surprise God. God knew what was going to happen prior to the story even taking place. God knows each and every one of us. God knew God knew before the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So in in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Okay? So the word of the Lord came to Jonah. At that time, prophets, the word of the Lord did come to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to the prophets. And through the prophets, they spoke to the people. So this should have been nothing new that uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Number two, or verse two, was the mission. The mission of chapter one, okay? It was God's mission. God wanted Jonah to go to great city of Nineveh and preach against it, and preach against its wickedness that has come up before me. So in verse two, Jonah was given a command. He was given a command from God to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against its wickedness. In this passage, the prophet Jonah was given instructions to go to Nineveh, which was about 500 miles away from his home. 
okay? He called Gath his home. He was to speak of the sins that they were committing and the death and destruction that would come upon them if they did not repent and turn from their wicked ways because their sins were separating them from God. The fact that God was calling Jonah to preach repentance to lost souls of Nineveh should tell us that God loves sinners and saints and that the destruction of both the Jewish people and the Gentile people was not in God's plan. God doesn't want to be separated from us. God wants us to be with him. So this, this story is about God's mercy and, and God's grace. So the mission field, the mission field where Jonah was to go is Nineveh, okay? And a little bit about the mission field. Um, a guy by the name of Nimrod, okay, uh, built the city of Nineveh. And Nimrod was known as a, a rebellious king who was rebellious against the Lord, okay? So... I don't know if you've ever been called a Nimrod before, and I don't know if, if where that came from, if that actually came from the name of Nimrod, but, but you know, that's pretty serious, I guess, when you are called a Nimrod. So <clears throat> I'll be careful what we say. <laughs> um, Nineveh was a city of about 120,000 people, and it was the capital of Assyria at that time, Okay. If we turn to Nahum chapter 3, we're going to find out um, some of the sins that God was talking about, about the people who were in Nahum and, and its inhabitants. So in Nahum chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder. Never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords, and glittering spears. Many casualties, piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses, all because of a wanton lust of a harlot, alluring the mistresses of sorceries who enslave nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. So, the people of Nineveh were, were not the nicest people. But one thing that they did need is they did need the Lord. Okay? And Jonah, Jonah was called to take the word of the Lord to the city of Nineveh. So, looking through the eyes of Jonah... At this time, he was given a, a pretty difficult task. You know, he had to go take God's word to this city, this type of people. Okay, but I think at this time, Jonah was maybe missing God uh, and, and what God was actually calling him to do, calling him to teach the word, to tell people to repent of their ways. To, to, to repent of what's keeping them separate from God. So I think maybe, maybe Jonah might have been thinking, um, why, would, why would God be sending me to my death? Because for sure, when you go to that city like that, I'm sure he's going to face death and persecution trying to, trying to get people to change their ways to change their attitudes, to change the way they look upon God, to change the way they act. Because as we read in Nahum, the city was, a, they were murderous people. They, they you know, the, the leaders were, were tough um, people. When they, when they went into other cities to destroy them, they plundered. So just not very good people. So, really, Jonah might have thought, you know, are these people really worthy of being, having the saving grace of God? Um, 
He might have thought that to himself. You know, but we got to remember that our God is an omnipotent God. He's all-powerful. He has the power to save the lost. God is merciful. He cares for all people. It's not God's will that anyone should perish. God chose Jonah to preach against the sins and lifestyles of the leaders of the people in Nineveh. God's repentance is for both Jews and Gentiles. In verse 3, we find out Jonah's plan. Okay, This is Jonah's plan. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. Okay, Jonah fleed from the Lord, or at least he tried to. Because Jonah wants no part in, in, in any of the plans that God has for him about talking to the people of Nineveh and their lost souls. Do you think because Jonah's afraid? Does he fear that God would not go with him and give him the power of the message to bring? I mean, this should be something uh, pretty familiar with with the prophets of that time because they were always getting instructions from God, okay? And they were always to give instructions to the people from God. So I don't think it was a fact that Jonah was afraid. And I don't think it's a fact that God, he was afraid that God wouldn't go with him. But we will get to the answer, the real answer in chapter four. So we'll have to wait a couple of weeks on the real answer. I'm sure everyone knows the ending to the story too, but, okay? But, you know, Jonah should have known better because actually the last person that we want to play hide and seek with is God, okay? God knows everything. God knows where we are, who we are. Um, Adam and Eve in the garden, think about it. What did they try to do? They tried to hide from God. He called out to them, and he said, why are you hiding? What did he tell them? They were ashamed, right? Because they'd sinned. They were ashamed. Okay? So God knows where we are. In Psalms 139, verses 7 to 14. And this is David. David wrote, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from my afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem in me behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And in Jeremiah 1, verses 5 and 6. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. So God knows us. God knows everything about us. There's nothing that we can do. Nothing that we can hide, nothing that we can, can say that is actually going to be, be, um, be a shock to God, okay? Now, we do serve an omnipotent God, okay? He's all-powerful, all right? And at this point in time, I think God was focused on... Jonah fleeing. So if you're, if you're a hunter and you have a, a hunting dog, when that dog gets the scent of whatever it's tracking, what's that dog do? He goes. And he doesn't stop. Sometimes they will go that far or that long that you lose them. Okay? Um, but this is the case. God is showing that he's going to, to track Jonah down, okay? I believe in the next portion of, of, the, of Scripture, and he's going to do whatever it takes to say, 
hey, Jonah, I'm here. I'm here. Whenever you decide to turn around, I'm here for you, okay? And, and at that time, at that time, Jonah, you know, I'm going to help you. You know, you turned your back on me. You ran. You fleed from me. I never left you, okay? God never leaves us or forsakes us. But he's, he's, through the next couple of verses, I believe what he's trying to do is get Jonah's attention. Jonah decided in verse 4 to sail to Tarshish, which was about 2,000 miles away. So he figured 2,000 miles away, I can get away from God. Far enough away from God. Okay? Unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately for Jonah, he boarded a ship in Joppa, okay, and set sail for Tarshish, thinking that God wouldn't be able to get him or find him or help him or get his attention. But... Our omnipotent Lord sent a great storm to the sea, a storm so great that it threatened to break up the ship that Jonah was on. Okay? A, a question for you here might be is, you think God was that ang angry at Jonah for not obeying, angry enough to take his life? You think that's what it was? No. Once again, I think it was God just trying to get Jonah's attention to get Jonah's submission, okay? You know, is there a storm in our life right now that, that God is trying to get our attention? You know, that we're running away from God? You know, he's just waiting there. Hey, take my hand. I can walk you through this storm. You know, I can walk you through whatever you face. I will be there. I will carry you through. In verse 5, each sailor cried out to his own God. The storm was so severe that they started throwing their cargo overboard in hopes of saving the ship and saving their own lives. I believe at this point to the sailors, whatever they had didn't matter. Their possessions, it didn't matter. Guess where they were going? They were going to the bottom of the sea. Okay? Okay. I think their main focus was to save their life, and they were willing to do anything, okay? They were willing to give up everything they owned to save their own life. Um, all the while, Jonah was below deck in a sound sleep, okay? Jonah slept through this storm. Now, I was never at sea, I was never on a, a large boat, or even a small boat, but I've, I've watched, uh, I've watched the, the crab hunters going <laughs> through some of them seas, and I don't know how anybody can sleep in that. I, 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 I don't know, but I believe God's hand was in that. I believe, you know, God helped them to fall into a deep sleep. Uh, who else do we know that slept during a storm? Jesus slept during a storm, okay? The one difference is Jesus controlled the storm, okay? Jonah, Jonah caused the storm. Jonah was the cause behind the storm. And we also, we also saw that Jonah was sleeping when people needed saving, okay? So we can look at it a couple of ways. Jonah could have did his part up, help rowing the ship, help trying to, to take him to safety. And likewise, Jonah could have went to Nineveh, but he decided to sleep. He decided to keep his mouth quiet. He decided not to do God's will. He chose to run. He chose to go away from Nineveh. So Jonah slept. You know, are we sleeping? The captain of the ship actually confronts Jonah and he says, get up and call upon your God for help. Maybe then we'll be safe. 
You know, I think that the sailors needing saving is, is a little bit like the Ninevites who also needed saving. They were calling on their own gods, none of which could save them. That's where Jonah could have presented the word, the way of the Lord to Nineveh and allowed the Lord to save his children. Instead, Jonah slept. In verse 7, they cast lots, and I think we, we already know that God had a plan in it because who did the lot fall on? It fell on Jonah. You know, imagine that. You know, God had his hand in this story because the lot did fall on Jonah. And they asked him a, a series of questions in verse 8. They asked him, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And from what people are you? So I think when these questions were asked, I really believe that this is when Jonah was going to have a heart-to-heart. -heart, okay, We were going to see at this time how he answers these questions, you know, what Jonah truly believes. You know, so I wonder if this is actually Jonah's rock bottom. You know, because when we actually are faced with, with a life and death situation, is that our rock bottom? You know, is that, is that the time when, when the only time that we want to cry out for God when we are at our rock bottom, okay? Fortunately, we serve a loving God, and he's there for us in the highs, in the lows, in the tops, in the bottoms. Um, so, but I believe this, this was Jonah's rock bottom. And in verse 9, we finally get the truth from Jonah, okay? Jonah admits, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the land. You know, and I think the way Jonah answered this, I'm wondering if, if, if after that, Jonah could actually go, finally, I faced up. I faced up to, to my sins. I faced up to my running from God. And now, now, now I have to, to pay the price for what I did, okay? I have to accept my, my fear and my, my punishment. And, and um, because for every action, there is a, a, a help me, help me, Bond, for every consequence. For, for every action, there's a consequence. And we, we tell that to the kids in, in, in Sunday school class, that for everything they do, there is a consequence, whether it's good or bad, okay? In verse 10, uh, the sailors, they were filled with fear, okay? Was, was this because they were afraid of dying at sea? Uh, or was this their life-saving moment that could change their lives forever? They knew Jonah was running from the Lord, and I believe the fear of the Lord opened their eyes and caused them to believe in the one true God that Jonah believed in and that Jonah trusted in. They tried praying to their gods, and it didn't work. Their gods weren't going to save them. Jonah's God could. The seas were getting rougher and rougher in verse 11, and the sailors asked Jonah, how do we make the storm stop? Um, I believe they knew the answer to that question. I believe they knew, um, but I, I believe that that. They, they, they knew, but they didn't want to know, okay? Because I believe, like, like the verse before, the fear of the Lord came upon them, upon the sailors, the fear of the Lord. Jonah was ready to end his life in verse 12, okay? He told the sailors that they had to throw him into the sea, and the sea would become calm. 
Jonah was ready to make the sacrifice so the sailors would be safe. Okay? <clears throat> we know of another sacrifice that was made for us. Okay? The sacrifice of Jesus. The difference between Jonah and Jesus is Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He was a sinless, perfect sacrifice who bore the wrath of God for our sake so we could have eternal life with God our Father. Jonah knew that he had to sacrifice himself to save the sailors. And he had to quit running from God. In verse 13, the sailors feared the wrath of God. They feared for their accountability. They feared that if, if they were the ones who throw them overboard, God was going to make them feel the wrath for murder. Okay? But that's not the case. God had his plan in this. God had his plan, and, and he knew, or he told those sailors, and he told Jonah that the only way to get out of this storm is for Jonah to get off the boat. Okay? The sailors were afraid, but, but they decided that they were going to follow through with God's plan, and they threw Jonah overboard. The sailors, they cried out to God. They said, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. So the sailors called out to God. Okay? That was their life-saving moment. You know, they worshiped their gods. They prayed to their gods, and their gods didn't help them. They prayed to the one true God. They prayed to Jonah's God. And, and they asked for forgiveness for having to throw Jonah overboard. So was this their life-saving moment? Was this the time that they cried out in their deepest, darkest moment? Hey, God, help us. Help us here. Help me. Save me, God. Because sometimes it does take us to be at our worst, you know, when we're staring death face to face, to call out to God for, for saving. And God is waiting with outstretched hand for us to grab a hold of. The sailors threw Joan overboard into the sea, and the sea calmed. The sailors greatly feared the Lord and made sacrifices to the Lord. So this was their life-saving moment. This was the time that they were saved. This, this, uh, this, um, this was their time. So in, in verse 17, we see that God's not done with Jonah yet, though. Okay? God could have left Jonah sink the whole way to the bottom and say bye-bye. Okay? Jonah lost at sea. Okay? But he didn't. God provided a big fish to come along and, and Jonah was swallowed up by the big fish, okay? Now, I believe, who's the big fish in reference to? Who's got Jonah right now? Who's got Jonah? Whether it's in the, in the belly of a fish or in the hands of God, God has Jonah right now. God is protecting Jonah, Okay? God might let Jonah have to face his consequences for three days, but he's got Jonah right where he wants him, okay? <clears throat> I wonder what it, like, what it would have been like for Jonah if he would have obeyed God's calling right away. Jonah was called to take the word of the Lord to Nineveh. We're called to take the gospel truth of Jesus Christ to all the world whether it's our homes, our work, our friends, our family, our neighbors. That's our Nineveh. Are we running away from God? Are we falling asleep while other people need saving? Think about that. God is a God for everyone. God wants everyone. Is God calling for us to get out of our comfort zone? 
Are we listening to God? Or are we doing all the talking? You know, God might be trying to talk to us, but we're too busy saying, God, give me this, give me this, help me do this, help me do this, instead of just listening and listening to hear the voice of God. Because uh, everybody will be poked and prodded until God gets our attention. It's a little bit like trying to come up here and teach the Sunday school. This was, this was my Nineveh for a couple of weeks here because this is not easy for me. Uh, it, it's a whole lot easier when you're, when you're standing in a classroom full of third and fifth graders. But there's a, a lot of intelligent people who I'm speaking to or are talking with, and it makes it difficult. So is this a start of my Nineveh? Probably so. But, you know, when you submit to God, he will help you do it. He will get you through it. Maybe if it happens again, he'll make it a little easier the next time. Maybe, maybe a little more calmer the next time or so on. But Romans 3.23, or Romans 3.23 and 24 say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. John 3.16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that who believe, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. We serve the same God that Jonah served. We can learn from, from Jonah chapter 1. We can't run from God. We can't hide from God. We only need to be willing to submit to God and what God wants us to do. He doesn't need our abilities. He wants our availability. We all can choose the choice that Jonah chose. God won't leave us or forsake us if we do for choosing that road. But we may be taught a couple of life lessons along the way and and maybe realize that it might have been a little easier if we did it God's way the first time. All we need to do is say, God, here I am, Lord. Guide me, use me, give me wisdom to do your will. Help me to show the love of Jesus to all unbelievers. Help us to see the good and not the bad in people. Help us to show the light of Jesus Christ by the way we live in our lives. Help us to look at others through the eyes of Christ. Not judgmental, but with mercy and grace. Just like you showed the sailors who worship their own gods until their eyes were opened to the God of heaven and earth. Through chapter 1, God never left Jonah. Even though Jonah tried to ride, run and hide from him and his sins. God was with Jonah on a stormy sea when Jonah admitted to the sailors he was running from God. God was still with Jonah. Finally, when Jonah was thrown into the sea, God was with Jonah. God provided a big fish to swallow Jonah. It's at our lowest point when we're able to allow God to pick up the pieces and make us whole again. So I thank you for your time. How about we close in prayer? God, we just thank you so much that uh, we can learn the lesson through, through Jonah. And God, we, um, we know that Jonah was a prophet called by you. And, and Lord, we just... Um, Pray that we would be willing to submit to your will instead of having to learn those hard lessons along the way. But God, we are so grateful for your mercy that, that you are there the whole time, just willing and waiting and wanting to pick us up if we choose the wrong direction. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge, and we thank you for your book of life. In your name we pray, amen.